This program is made possible in part by AARP South Carolina. ETV, the state newspaper, the Greenville News, in association with the Island Packet, the Beaufort Gazette, the Florence Morning News, the Sun News of Myrtle Beach, the Herald of Rock Hill, and the Sumter Item present ETV Debates. Tonight, candidates for Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman and Tom Thompson. And now, your moderator, Charles Bierbauer, Dean of USC's College of Mass Communication and Information Studies. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Superintendent of Education debate. We'd also like to welcome our ETV radio listeners. Joining me tonight to ask questions of the candidates is Jamie Self of the State Newspaper. Candidates joining us are Molly Spearman, a Republican candidate from Saluda, and Tom Thompson, a Democrat from Columbia. American Party candidate Ed Murray did not meet ETV's debate criteria in order to participate. Before we begin tonight, some quick ground rules. Each candidate will have the opportunity to make a one-minute opening statement, and from there they will have 90 seconds to answer our questions. If necessary, I'll allow a 30-second rebuttal. We drew names when the candidates arrived for the order in which we will start. Mrs. Spearman, we will begin with your opening statement. Thank you so much for watching tonight. Thanks to ETV, the state paper, and all the other newspapers for sponsoring this event. I am really honored to have this possibility to serve as your next state superintendent of education. And I know that I'm prepared for this job. My career began 18 years as a classroom music teacher principal. I served four terms in the state legislature, on, worked on the education committee, the Ways and Means Committee, six years at the Department of Education as a deputy superintendent of education, and for the past almost 10 years now, worked with all the principal, school leaders, and business leaders across this state. I will draw on all of that experience and those relationships to ensure that every graduate, when they walk across that stage at their high school graduation ceremony and receive their South Carolina diploma, that they're ready for the next step, whether it's technical college, college, a career, military, and to be productive citizens in South Carolina. I need your vote to make that become a reality. Mr. Thompson. Good evening, and thank you for tuning in today. My name is Tom Thompson. I'm a lifelong uh, educator, career educator, and lifelong Democrat, um, committed to the Democratic Party as the party that traditionally and consistently supports public education. Uh, I have been throughout the system, um, so I know the education system uh, and know how to address the problems that are, uh, that are part of, of the system. I've been a high school math teacher, principal, uh, worked at the State Department of Education, uh, professor at USC, and a dean at South Carolina State University. So I've been throughout the state. I have relationships with uh, administrators and teachers throughout the state, been in every school district, and know how to work with those individuals to make sure that we're collaborating on the issues. They know that, that my uh, word is, is my word and, and that I'll work with them to make the system work well for children. Thank you. Uh, when you were each here for our primary debates, much was said about the national effort to craft a common core for educating our children. To some of those primary candidates, common core seemed to be the be all and end all. But could you tell us please, starting first with, with Ms. Spearman, what you believe would be your priorities in relation to common core? Right. Well, Charles, you're right, and if you remember when I was here back in the primary debate, I said that I supported what the legislature was going, looked like they were going to do, and that was to set up a panel to review immediately our standards, and that's happening right now. I'm glad that's happening. Uh, I think Washington does become too involved sometime in things that can be handled better at the state and local level. And I'm very, very optimistic with the group of t South Carolina teachers who are currently reviewing and rewriting the standards. We have different groups of experts from across the state who will be reviewing those. And that will be my first priority as state superintendent. We've got to get this issue settled. We have to have high standards approved by South Carolinians so that we can make sure that every graduate is prepared for whatever the next step will be. So I'm very optimistic that will be my number one focus because it's been too much unrest with our teachers. It's not fair to teachers and students. We've got to get this issue settled. So uh, along with that settling of the standards, the next step will be the assessment. 
We've been testing too much. We've got to have an accurate common sense type of assessment. So that will be the second thing and then we'll work on the teacher evaluation after that. I'm sure we'll be talking about it later. Mr. Thompson, same question. It's unfortunate that um, things turned out the way they did with, with Common Core. Um, teachers having the, so to speak, the rug pulled out from, from under them created a chaotic condition in our schools. As I talked with principals uh, around the state, many of them told me that their teachers were pleased with the kinds of things that they were beginning to, to get to do um, with their students and that their students were making lots of progress and they were happy about being engaged with, with the curriculum. Um, we have to have standards uh, that are rigorous. We were going to have to recalibrate our standards in, in any way. Um, so we, we will have to make sure that, that that's done and that those standards uh, are, are rigorous uh, and they will meet the needs of, of our children. Um, the, the problem solving, uh, the way we do testing, um, what's going to be addressed uh, so that we move away from fact testing to uh, testing for problem solving ability, identifying the information that's needed to solve the problem, as well as where to get that information and, and, and how to use it. Um, we also w was going, we're, we're going to, to be required to do uh, tests on, on computers. Um, and that would require that all of the school districts be outfitted so that children can do that. And that was going to, to work well for all of our school districts uh, and be a godsend for our, our higher need school districts. Well, I, I wonder if you couldn't be a little bit more specific. As, as Ms. Spearman points out, the, the criteria are being rewritten now. They're being addressed. Uh, the current superintendent, Mick Zace, did not want Common Core even in the mix of consideration uh, when that, uh, when that uh, uh, body was convened. He's, he's relented now to some degree. You would likely take office, either of you, whoever's elected, mm -hmm. in the midst of the process. So what do you bring to that process, and what specifically would you like the end result to be? Let's start with you, Dr. Thompson. I'd like to make sure that that process is a collaborative process. Uh, when I take office, that process will be somewhere uh, towards completion. Uh, we will have to review the status of the project at, at that time. Uh, to make sure that it is going to meet the needs of the children and school districts in South Carolina so that they are, when they graduate, they're ready for the workforce or for higher ed or whatever the next step is. Um, so the process, you, my job will be to bring in uh, individuals uh, who are knowledgeable uh, in the various areas to make sure that the standards are where they should be uh, and that as a school system, the total system, we can move forward in South Carolina. The federal government is not the problem here. The federal government is not our enemy. The federal government does have an interest in public education and should have an interest in public education because there are federal needs uh, that, that should be met. But it was not the federal government that's associated with, with Common Core. Uh, that was the state governors um, that uh, initiated that, uh, uh, that model, uh, and the model um, was fine up until the point that the federal government became a political put football uh, in the whole affair. And I think it's unfair to the teachers. Ms. Freeman, same question with, with some sure. specificity as to how you'd pick this yeah. up in, in mid-game. Well, here's what I'm gonna be looking for uh, and relying on. First of all, I have um, already been talking with teachers who are involved with this process, with the folks at the department who are involved, and I'm very optimistic. It, it sounds as though we're gonna get a very good product. What that product has to have, high standards, but standards have changed, and it's not so much now students spitting back information to you, but uh, the standards need to allow for students to gain information, but to problem solve. And so we have to look at the level of standards and is, are they allowing students to take practical information and turn it into situations where they're problem solving, they're collaborating. Uh, the experts also look at scaffolding. 
how does it move from one grade level to another? And that's one of the things that uh, educators really liked about the current standards. So we're gonna be looking for the scaffolding throughout the process from kindergarten all the way up through till they graduate. So I'll have to rely on some experts uh, and look forward to doing that, but there are a couple of key issues that those standards will have, have to have, and those, those are a couple that I've mentioned there. Jamie. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, school funding. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, the General Assembly approved um, many millions of dollars, 60 million for reading coaches and technology uh, across the state. Uh, Governor Haley obviously was a big advocate of that. There's still a lot of talk about where we go from here. So I'm curious what you think about as these programs roll out and as we continue to put more resources uh, into reading and to technology, uh, what should we be thinking of? What cautionary tale do you have for the General Assembly? Uh, what do you think the next step is? Should I go first? Uh, Ms. Okay. Yes. Well, I've, I supported uh, the initiatives that the legislature passed and it was a bipartisan effort and I really do think they're moving in the right direction. We, we added a poverty index weighting so that schools uh, children in poverty will receive a 20% increase in funding, so that was important. The technology infrastructure is so important, but and reading coaches, all of those things were really sound ideas that will change student achievement and improve student achievement. My message to the General Assembly, though, is that it can't just be a one-year fix. It has to be a steady uh, support of those initiatives. Um, what I'm hearing from school districts is that it also has to be very flexible because school districts are at different level in the implementation of reading coaches, of technology. So they don't need the General Assembly to tell them specific things to do, just general ideas and then let those local officials maneuver that funding into their programs as needed. So we've got to really assure that uh, we always have flexibility to suit those local needs and um, with the reading, uh, another part of that, reading coaches are so important, uh, the Read to Succeed bill, I s totally support that. But again, we have to allow those districts that already have successful programs to continue those and use whatever is working there. Spotlight that and then replicate it in other areas. I don't ever believe in just one fix. There are different fixes for different communities and certainly for different students. So we have to be sure that that's a part of the plan. And Mr. Thompson? What we have to do is take a systematic approach um, to solving those, those issues. Um, my, my recommendation is a, is a three component approach. First and foremost, looking at the way we fund schools, not so much the way we fund schools, but the symbolism um, um, behind some of the things that, that we do. Right now, our Constitution promises our students a minimally adequate education which is repulsive. Um, the, our children deserve more and we should, we should work to give them, uh, to give them more and, meet, and make sure that we're meeting the needs of those children. So I'm recommending that, that we change that language to high quality education in the Constitution so that that cost associated with high quality education then gets folded into our formula uh, and becomes uh, the, the the amount around which we base uh, the base student cost, uh, and then we encourage and, 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 and force, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, our legislature to fully fund the base student costs. Beyond that, uh, once the funding is stable and sufficient, um, we should invest in early childhood education, birth to kindergarten, so that we can work with children and parents to be prepared for school. Uh, and then uh, once we have children and parents prepared, when they enter school, we should have a high quality, challenging, engaging curriculum ready for them to take them the rest of the way. And I'd, I'd like to uh, follow up uh, with that. Uh, a lawmaker I interviewed recently uh, said that all it takes to see the inequality in how schools are funded is to drive from one district to the next. And he talked about the, the, the district's ability to raise taxes locally, to pay for things like buildings uh, and iPads even. And one district might be putting an iPad in every student's hands through this, this taxing ability, while another district is just struggling to, to replace an old building. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Thompson, you mentioned the Democratic Party's vision. Uh, the, right. the person at the top of the ticket supports a statewide uh, funding model uh, that would basically say that any business growth in the state would go to benefit all school districts in the state. Do you support that? Please start. Well, um, 
I think that if you, you uh, and I think you have a copy of the 10-point plan that we recently released, uh, and that within that plan, uh, we talked about creating uh, a, a public-private uh, public organization, a nonprofit organization, uh, that would be used to solicit uh, funds to meet the needs of high-need school districts around some of the very same issues that, uh, that you talked about. Um, to, to kind of assist in the financing of, of building projects uh, as well to make sure that uh, those districts are able to meet the critical needs uh, that may come up unexpectedly. Um, so we will use that uh, as a way of kind of stabilizing uh, those, uh, uh, helping to stabilize those districts so that they are uh, on the footing with other districts that are able to provide uh, resources and, and materials because of the tax base. Uh, we have to make uh, with those districts uh, teaching, um, the teaching profession uh, much more attractive so that we can attract and, and retain high quality teachers in those areas uh, and, and that nonprofit organization would help to work with uh, private uh, citizens within the state, private organizations, uh, as, as well as the State Department to make sure that we can, we can meet the needs of those districts. Um, Ms. Spearman, do you, do you support some sort of statewide funding model, as a state millage rate, for right. example? Well, Jamie, you've hit the nail on the head. I, our current education funding formula is almost 50 years old now, and it was it was devised very uh, accurately back in the day when every community in this state had a textile mill and they had in industry to to help fund schools in their own local community. That's no longer exist, and so for the last almost 50 years now, we've been patching the formula, and it has gotten so complex and so. Um, divided. There's so many strains of funding that few people understand it. So I definitely support and would look forward to leading the conversation to redo the formula. We're not talking about more money here, but just redoing the way we collect the revenue to make it more fair and equitable uh, for every person in the state so that a student, no matter where they live, will receive the right type of uh, education. Um, you're right, uh, you don't have to do much but drive across from one county line to the other to see the disparity. We put too much burden on the local uh, community and I do think it's a state responsibility. So I look forward to leading the conversation. There are several plans out there now uh, that I think are good. There's no one perfect one that I've seen yet, but uh, I do support us looking at this. We made strides last year with the poverty weighting, for sure. That was a big piece of it, and the legislature has fixed that. But once again, it was a Band-Aid fix, so the whole formula, I think, needs to be looked at. Well, I, I just want to follow up Go with ahead. a quick sure. question, and please make it a, a brief answer, but do you think that when a Boeing comes here, when a BMW comes here, that the tax revenues that those businesses generate should benefit the state as a whole, all districts in the state, mm -hmm. basically be redistributed in some way. Should South Carolina be looking at a model that does that? I would be in favor of, of looking at a model that would help to share uh, those, those resources um, so that, um, that we have a way of helping all districts um, to have a stable and sufficient level of funding so that uh, they can provide uh, for the needs uh, of the children uh, within those areas as well as for the school districts. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. Yeah, I, I know that when industry comes in, there are state incentives that are given, so I do think at least a portion of the revenue should be shared uh, and benefit the entire state. I'd like to come back to something that each of you said in, in earlier responses. Mr. Thompson, you talked about uh, the minimally adequate funding of education being repulsive, and you said, uh, well, the, the minimally adequate language is something that the state Supreme Court has not yet acted on after right. many years. And then you said, force the legislature to, f you have no power to force <laughs> the legislature. What you have is a bully pulpit. How do you use it? Well. Um, th that's one of the beauties of this, this position being elected rather than appointed. Um, it gives the state superintendent of education kind of equal footing when we're sitting around the table talking about 
um, funding the public education system with the governor's office and the state legislature. Yes, uh, w when the legislature, we approach the legislature uh, for that funding, if, if everything goes well and, and we can use general, uh, general persuasion, that's fine. Likely, it doesn't. Uh, so with it being an elected position, um, you may have to, it, the superintendent may have to bring public pressure uh, to convince the legislature that the needs of the children, the needs of the public education system should be a priority for, for the state. Uh, and that's the strategy uh, that I think is, is important for the state superintendent to have. You certainly don't want to use it all of the time because then it becomes uh, ineffective. Uh, but those times for those things that are most critical, that are most important, uh, that, that having the, the influence to bring some kind of pressure, um, uh, I, I think, uh, is, is something that needs to be part of the superintendent's toolbox. Ms. Spearman, same, same question. In essence, the bully pulpit. You talked about leading the conversation. Is mm -hmm. that what you have in mind? Well, leading, um, I've really been blessed with a career that I've spent a lot of time with legislators, business community leaders, parents, and always tried to build, never burn bridges, and keep those relationships strong. So I do think I'm equipped in an unusual way to carry this, lead this conversation. I think it's about prioritizing. I think tax, we're probably never going to return to the revenue <laughs> that was back pre-2008. Um, as educators, we have to learn to prioritize and to make sure that we're spending our dollars on the most effective programs that will enhance student achievement. Um, we have to be accountable too. I will always be reminding my colleagues of that and helping them um, in, in deciding those things and spotlighting on the programs that are working. But I also think it's really important. We really haven't had a combined vision for public education in the state. Uh, the governor has a vision, the superintendent has a vision, the chamber may have a vision, the principals have a vision. We need to come together on a common vision. And there is one out there that's building support, and I've been fortunate to be involved with that, this profile of the 21st century graduate. It talks about what does a graduate need to know, the content, the characteristics, and the social skills that are so important that businesses are talking about. And my plan is to bring, rally everybody around this vision that everything we do, every policy we adopt, the dollars we spend will be supporting what the 21st graduate needs to know. So it's about prioritization as much as anything, and I, yes, I feel prepared to lead that conversation. Let me ask the, the political question then, Ms. Spearman. Uh, you were a Democrat, you're now yes. a Republican. You talked about the governor's vision. Are you in lockstep with the governor? And, <laughs> and if not, where not? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know about lockstep. Um, I don't know that I'm in lockstep with anybody. I've never agreed with anybody uh, on everything. But I do believe uh, that our governor now has set uh, the momentum for uh, supporting public education in the state. It has been a bipartisan effort though. Uh, over the last two years, folks have come together and, and we talked with her and legislators have talked and we talked about things that have been talked about for a long time. What will improve student achievement? It's reading, it's technology infrastructure, it's professional development, it's stronger teachers and principals. And we need a poverty waiting. So she listened, she heard, the legislature listened and heard and passed those reforms almost unanimously. So um, I, my job as state superintendent, I think, is to bring that message to whomever the governor is and to work very closely. And um, I, I am blessed to have had a career where I've worked with all these folks and I think we can hit the ground running on day one. Uh, Mr. Thompson, slightly different vein, but a similar type question. In one sense, you started in, in public schools and then shifted to higher education. You now work for a for-profit organization. It's been roughly 30 years since you were in, in a public school, if I read your resume correctly. <laughs> um, are you up to speed? <laughs> Absolutely, um, and it has not been 30 years uh, uh, since I've been in school. In fact, I have continued my work with schools to directly. Um, I, I work as a program evaluator, um, and I'm currently working uh, with the University of South Carolina Aiken uh, on a project. It's usually um, surrounding uh, math and science. Um, the, the contracts either come from uh, the uh, uh, Commission on Higher Ed or the National Science Foundation. So I am in schools uh, uh, regularly visiting classrooms, talking with teachers, 
about improving their, their skills in teaching mathematics and, and science. So uh, yes, I, I am well aware of, of, of what the issues are uh, in terms of what's going on, uh, going on in schools. We have a shade under two minutes and Jamie has the last question. I'll ask you for concise answers. Right. So uh, obviously one of the ways we can improve schools that folks are talking about is school choice, whether that's private school choice or whether it's public school choice like charter schools. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Thompson, where do you stand on private and public school choice? Should it stay in one realm or the other? Can you do that in about 30 seconds? <laughs> it should stay in public. <laughs> it should stay in, in public. We want to make sure that the, the parents uh, feel that, that they have genuine choice within the public sector uh, so that the resources that are available uh, to public education remain in public education. We have to make sure that we make the public school system as strong as it can possibly be to drive economic development in this state before we start looking outside of the system to do anything. Thank you, Ms. Grimmel. I'm really proud of the progress we've made in school choice. There are options out there now. There's not a single family in South Carolina, no matter where you live, who don't have another choice rather than traditional school. We have a virtual school now at South Carolina Charter Virtual School. So you do, every family has a choice, and that is a good thing. And I'll be working for more choices within the public school system. I did support the uh, special ed, uh, which is a private, uh, system where students can go to the private school you know, of special ed, but it had a real review. Uh, uh, it met strong accountability, and I think that's very important to be included in any type of option. Thank you both. I feel like I was in school on one of those time tests, <laughs> and it was running by rather quickly. Thanks to both of our candidates for joining us this evening, and also to Jamie Self of the state. For more information on all the upcoming ETV debates, visit scetv.org. Now for everyone at ETV, I'm Charles Beerbauer. Good evening. <laughs>